this is my answer to Paul Ennis's answer to Levi Bryant. So it's called Paul Ennis's Missed Occasion, a non Laruelian response to Levi Bryant. So I must admit that I was disappointed by Ennis's reply to Levi Bryant's talk called Post-Humanism and Lacan's Graph of Sexuation. I must note that I refused to conserve the misleading part of Levi Bryant's title to ontologies as despite squinting and using my 3D glasses left over from The Amazing Spider-Man I can only see one ontology that is to say ontotheology in Levi Bryant's uh, ontological graph ontotheology in its naive version on the left and in its nostalgic version on the right as withdrawal is itself a form of transcendence I was very shocked by this talk right from the beginning Levi Bryant begins by claiming that it is at first sight surprising to link Lacan with post-humanism and justifies this with a quotation from Lacan quote the universe is the flower of rhetoric unquote which looks like a correlationist or even a linguistic idealist thesis. Now, as to the purported initial surprisingness of juxtaposing Lacan and posthumanism, this itself is rather surprising, coming from a Lacanian who proclaims loudly that he is very familiar with the tradition of ideological critique. The connection between Lacan and Althusser and structuralist anti-humanism is precisely what leaps to mind uh, almost instantly. Althusser's essay on Freud and Lacan was published in the 1960s, as was its translation into English. And the Althusserians were an important vector of the promulgation of Lacanian theory. Anti humanism is one of the strands that now compose post humanism, so the leap is, in fact, minuscule. Secondly, the statement, the universe is the flower of rhetoric, is an anti humanist statement affirming the agency of the signifier and dethroning human agency. This is a conceptual statement and cannot be refuted by what I call Harmanian hand-waving of the style quote, duh, that gives agency to language and language is made by humans so it's humanist and correlationist, unquote. When I say quote, it's a made up quote that corresponds to a uh, basic uh, pre conscious uh, commentary to the sorts of arguments that we hear or read often coming from o -O Oxians. Anyhow, the OO style of argument is to bet on historical ignorance and for the rest to take philosophical statements out of their theoretical context efface the conceptual meaning and retain only the common sense exception of words and then englobe it in a big bogus category like correlationism which can be made to include any position at all including Harmons and Bryant's as Alexander Galloway has shown on uh, the blog uh, An und für sich uh, on the 3rd of June uh, 2012. One reason I was disappointed by Ennis's reply is because I knew he has been working on Laruel, so I was expecting a powerful Laruelian analysis of the philosophical decision in OOO.
Oh, object-oriented ontology seems a perfect example of Laruelle's general analysis. A selection is made in the given of a datum, here objects, that is then elevated to, a, to the status of a condition of the given. Objects that are present in the imminence of the given are selected out as the transcendent condition of the given and this transcendental gesture imposes a disjuncture in the imminent field between these new transcendent real objects and the merely uh, empirical sensual objects that were the original field from which the real ones were selected out. The distinction between the real objects and central objects is both intrinsic to their imminent difference and an extrinsic transcendent distinction that constitutes this difference. The various strategies to conjoin causality and illusion in Harmon's case, to conjoin what has thus been disjoined via withdrawal, constitute the dubious charm of object-oriented ontology. But Paul Ennis, who was perfectly capable of giving such an analysis, did not take that path. And we have unfortunately been deprived of the details and unforeseen twists and turns that he could certainly have furnished to surprise and delight us. Paul Ennis's response to Levi Bryant did not take this manic Laruelian path, but instead took a more nostalgic turn, where OOO is a form of nostalgic return to ontotheology via its watered down version of transcendence called withdrawal. Ennis looks affectionately back at anti realism obscurely sensing that despite a uh, Oaksian propaganda based on the bogus concept of correlationism, anti-realism may still have uh, some things to teach us. I wish to remark that correlationism is a bogus concept that trades on a confusion between a narrow conceptual sense that would best be designated idealism or post-Kantianism, and an extended notional sense that can cover anything and everything. So it manages to combine the very narrow, negatively valued intention of the first, and the very large, though conceptually vacuous, extension of the second. Ennis solemnly accepts at face value Bryant's 2D projection of a 3D diagram which I would have liked to have seen inserted in Prometheus as a mystifying explanation of why the Aegides hate us the de-withdrawal of God enacted in the resurrection of the engineer leading to the death of man He goes so far as to praise it for its encapsulation of the recent trend that, quote, has seen us move away from philosophies of transcendence towards those favouring imminence. There is no apparent irony as he contemplates a Lacanian who, in the first five minutes of his talk, manages to falsify the historical record of the anti-humanist inspiration Heidegger and reception Althusser of Lacan and to travesty his thought as a correlationist humanist shell that nevertheless in its most ridiculous content the graph of sexuation prefigured after the event the Deleuze event the move towards not imminence itself and here Ennis's suave and subtle style begins to show its acerated teeth 
but towards favoring imminence. Whom the gods would destroy, they first uh, do favor. And Bryant favors Deleuze with his Lacanian backstabbing. He favors imminence with his Harmanian withdrawal, a word that he now wishes to relinquish, withdrawing from withdrawal. I say that Lacan's graph of sexuation prefigures Deleuze and Guattari's ideas after the event because it was first expounded in his seminar in 1973 and represented a very weak and watered down appropriation of insights that Deleuze and Guattari had elaborated over the preceding four years precisely to critique Lacan. Guattari tells us, when I was put in touch with Deleuze in 1969, I grabbed the opportunity. I progressed in my contestation of Lacanism on two points, Oedipal triangulation and the reductionism of his doctrine of the signifier. Machine and structure, a uh, crucial uh, conference uh, according to both uh, Guattari and Deleuze, was given also in 1969, using the concept of the machine to break through the purported omnipresence of the signifier. So we have in 1969 the abandonment of Freudian psychoanalysis and its Lacanian variant, the critique of Oedipal triangulation, the definite exit from a preoccupation with discursive formations, and the transition from the hegemony of the signifier to a machine ontology. There is no synthesis of Lacan and Deleuze and Guattari, but a conceptual revolution, a radical paradigm change, an incommensurable leap. Bryant's paper ignores all this, falsifies the historical record, and quietly tries to annex Deleuzean and Guattarian insights into a paradigm whose fundaments they rejected. This strategy of tacit annexation and adulteration was one of Lacan's preferred modes of erudition and creativity. Levi Bryant even claims that Lacan was the first anti-Oedipus because in his system men don't have the phallus and the place of the sovereign can never be occupied. But such language retains the language of the psychoanalyst priest and his vision of anarchy as somehow the negation of the negation, as that which does not fall under the function of castration. Bryant involuntarily confirms my thesis that there is no synthesis of uh, Lacan and Deleuze and Guattari and that all attempts at such a synthesis void Deleuze and Guattari of their conceptual singularity and amount to a curious neo-Lacanian hodgepodge masquerading in Deleuzean vocabularies. The idea that Lacan's graph really kids. There's arrows and quantifiers and even a dummy function that can stand in for virtually anything. Castration, language, or even withdrawal, as is claimed by Levi Bryant in The Democracy of Objects, page 265. The idea that this graph of sexuation expresses anything interesting about ontologies of imminence is ludicrous. Bryant's ontology may be an ontology of imminence. I'm willing to reserve judgment on that. However, Graham Harmon's object-oriented ontology is certainly not one of imminence, but of a totally anemic transcendence, as we shall see. Besides, even Deleuze and Guattari always maintained that imminence is not enough and that it must be associated with positivity and abundance. This is their Nietzschean engagement. 
The graph of annexation, as interpreted by Bryant, contains the statement that not all x's are subject to the language function. This timid not all x's is a very ascetic and impoverished form of imminence, especially as it is accompanied by another assertion in logical contradiction to it. There is no x that is not subject to the function. Take your peek as to what the function, the function is. This is quite astonishing from someone who regularly presumes to give others, such as Alexander Galloway, lessons in baby logic, such as you cannot derive an ought from an is. That was not even applicable to Galloway's analysis. For details, see Galloway's post in uh, the blog Oaths, AUFS, Brian's lesson in the comments, and my pedagogical unpacking of the obvious in my blog commentary. But apparently, a uh, logical contradiction is okay if it comes from Lacan. However, at this point in his argument, when he began to talk about Bryant favouring imminence, I began to forgive Ennis for his um, non Laruelian gambit. I was so disappointed, I constructed a fictional Ennis, master of irony and equivocation, who was destroying Bryant's paradigm while feigning to share its preoccupations. Maybe, I thought, Ennis is one-upping Laruel himself. Maybe he's doing non-philosophy disguised as philosophy and the subtly ori verb favouring hinted at this transcendental positing of an imminent datum as a transcendent factum conditioning the empirical disjunction of that datum by means of its transcendental difference the standard Laruelian type of analysis. It seemed to me potentially a stroke of ironic genius, and Ennis was just getting started. No doubt, I imagined, fearing that his ironic expression favouring imminence was too explicit and risked revealing the subtle undercurrents of his non Laruelian gambit, Paul Ennis apparently decides to cloud the issue with a cryptic declaration. He affirms transcendence quote, has a way of generating and sustaining knots. Unquote. True, he goes on to explain this crypticism with some misdirection about anti-realism aiming to ground knowledge and ending up regretfully, but to whose regret? He doesn't say and remains veiled in ambiguity. So anti-realism aiming to ground knowledge and ending up regretfully ungrounding it. Strange conception of anti-realism. But coming straight after a twisted praise of one of Lacan's graphs, this phrase seems to refer maliciously to Lacan's late obsession with knots, thus implying that Lacan remained totally on the side of transcendence and that even his mathematical accoutrements of graphs, mathemes and knots, far from undermining his intrinsic transcendent position, reinforced and accomplished uh, this transcendence. Once again, Ennis seemed to insinuate, insinuate this with a single word, knots, as before he did with favoring, the choice of which could appear to be an innocent gaff, a mere slip of the tongue. I imagine the audience becoming restless, feeling an obscure tension, unconsciously, that consciously they discount. Ennis continues to soothe us by rattling off various false stereotypes about anti-realism's aporias, and even cites the epistemologically and semantically unsound Mayasu as an authority on the failure of anti-realism to ground the sciences. 
this is as far as Ennis gets with um, reliable authorities. When in fact the major achievement of anti-realism was to persuade everyone, including the realist, that such grounding was impossible, unnecessary and undesirable. Ennis does not even mention Bachelard, Serre, Deleuze, Lyotard, Derrida, Laroel, nor does he cite Popper, Quine, Kuhn, Lakatoche, Feyerabend, Latour. He lulls his audience with very vague references to post Kantian anti realists, the very repetition of this word suggesting subliminally that the real world of intellectual struggle is far off. He refers to Mayasu, whose version of the history of philosophy for dummies uh, captivated a generation of Oaxians. Then suddenly, when everyone thought that Ennis would never actually say anything, he unleashed a lightning bolt. I quote, My first question is to what extent you believe that speculative realism remains entangled in the logic of jouissance, because the object of desire, which in some sense must be the real, cannot actually be captured." Unquote. I imagined that at this point many of the Lacanians present either fainted or ran screaming from the room. Nobody could have seen uh, that coming. Ennis's, to my mind, uh, dark humour, all this in the fiction that I elaborated to uh, cover over my disappointment. Ennis's dark humour once again becomes almost too evident at this point. He unshamefacedly accuses the bad guys, the post-Kantian anti-realists, using terminology that in fact applies to the Oxians of somewhat perversely chasing numeral ghosts and deriving enjoyment precisely from the fact that they know that they will never catch them. And this generates an all too comfortable space to retreat to. Now, he accuses the post Kantian anti realists of this horrible syndrome, but it turns out that it is a direct transposition of Harmon's position in the third table, where he says, and I quote, We can only be hunters of objects and must even be non-lethal hunters since objects can never be caught. The world is filled primarily with ghostly objects withdrawing from all human and inhuman access. End of quote. That's on page 12 of the third table by Graham Hart. Yet again, by seeming to agree with the Oxian self-image as favouring imminence, my fictional ironic Ennis manages to paint a picture of the transcendent philosophers in the very terms that the Oxians use to describe themselves. The courage and the finesse necessary to bring off such a manoeuvre left me flabbergasted. This is the force of what I felt could only be called the Ennis Gambit. To myself, I define the Ennis Gambit thus. He, treacher he treacherously paints a picture of the supposed enemies of OOO, the transcendent philosophers, in the very terms that the Oxians use to describe their own position. The key concept here is the perfidious accusation against the post-Kantians of taking a perverse pleasure in chasing uncatchable noumenal ghosts, which the third table shows to be, to be a very close description of Graham Harmon's position, enunciated in very nearly the same words as we have seen. Ennis virtually confirms this reading, but with attenuating qualifications when he says, and I quote, if this attitude is explicit for continental thinkers, might it not simply be currently implicit within speculative re realism? End of quote. My quotation from the third table, remember, 
The world is filled primarily with ghostly objects withdrawing from all human and inhuman access. Shows that at least for Harmon, this attitude of perverse enjoyment in chasing numinal ghosts is indeed quite explicit and he even baptizes it with the name of erotic model. So the logic of jouissance is explicitly endorsed. Unfortunately, I came to realize that Paul Ennis was not a covert Laurelian double agent using his mastery of irony and equivocation to subvert from within OOO in general and Brian's strange Lacanian instantiation of it in particular. So my disappointment returned even stronger than before. I'd like to make a few concluding remarks. One, OOO would be an easy target for a Larowellian critique, but Ennis does not take this path, though he has indicated his intention to do so in the future. I look forward to such a critique as I consider that Deleuze and Feyerabend give us the material for a non Larowellian, non philosophical critique. I have been pursuing my own version of non philosophy for some time now. I would say since 1972, 1973, so that makes um, 40 years almost of non-philosophy. And I am curious to see what people can do with Laruel. I think that Laruel's anti bad Jew is a truly brilliant book, far superior to Badiou's badly named book Deleuze, which in fact should have been called the anti Deleuze. We all know what a hatchet job it was. In this book, Laruel pulls no punches, and I find myself in harmony with the style as well as the content of that critique. Two, I think that Harmon's ontology is one of transcendence, and that Bryant's, insofar as it concords with Harmon's meta-categories, is one of transcendence too, even if he fills these meta-categories with... Uh, an imminent uh, categorial content. Laruel, once again, is quite good on these mixes of transcendence and imminence that give themselves out as philosophies of imminence. Harmon himself is obliged to mix together and to persuade us to conflate a set of transcendent metacategories and another set of imminent categories meant to uh, instantiate them. He's obliged to create these mixtures whenever he gives an example of his supposedly unknowable objects. They are knowable, but he, he gives examples. My point of view is, however, purely Farabendian. These ontologies are far too constraining on matters that only empirical, though not necessarily scientific, research can decide. In this light, Bryant's post-Festum Lacanian lessons on imminence seem unjustified in content and comic in form. Lacan's graph of sexuation as a lesson in imminence. Three, I am appalled by the impoverished account of the history of philosophy that Mayasu promotes via his bogus concept of correlationism. Harman repeats his illiterate idea that epistemology is all about access without feeling the need to cite one major or even minor epistemologist. Does Karl Popper or Thomas Kuhn or Richard Rorty propose an epistemology of access? The idea is ridiculous. Popper's philosophy begins with a critique of something like a philosophy of access that he calls the bucket theory of knowledge. Bryant tries to enrich this discussion by talking about many more continental figures, but he seems to think that Bascar is an important epistemologist and he glibly proposes Lacan as a thinker of imminence while at the same time elaborating a Deleuzean machinic ontology. So Bryant is a very unreliable narrator indeed. For it is becoming clear to more and more people that the new object-oriented philosophy of Graham Harmon is not as advertised a joyful return 
to the rich and variegated texture of the concrete. After all these decades of dusty textual obsession and confinement, my thesis is clear. O O O is a philosophy based on ghostly, bloodless, nearly intelligible real objects that transcend any of the regimes and practices that give us qualitatively differentiated objects in any recognizable sense. What Harman misleadingly calls sensual objects and qualities are, as he declares, utter shams. In his system, see the third table, page six, where we see that not only central objects and qualities in the ordinary sense are shams, but also the objects and qualities of virtually any other truth regime, the sciences, the humanities, and common sense. Only Harman's realist philosophy and some artistic practices escape this. Demotion to the domain of relative truth concerning simulacra, and only on the proviso that they allude to the real objects and qualities, and do not try to present them directly or to represent them veridically. Objects withdraw from these truth regimes, that is, etymologically, they abstract themselves. Real objects are abstractions. Indeed, they are abstraction itself. This is not a revolutionary new weird realism. This is regressive transcendent realism, cynically pat- packaged as its opposite. Five. Contrary to what Levi Bryant claims, withdrawal has nothing to do with non-totalization. Rather, withdrawal is a guarantee of totalization in the real, of what one would call extra cognitive, or Noumenal totalization. It is the correlate of a synchronic ontology, one that has no place for constitutive temporality. It is no use arguing that the real is infinite, as an infinite set can be well defined and, as such, totalized. Infinity is no guarantee against totalization, nor is withdrawal. Abundance, however, does prevent. Totalization, and I'm here referring to the Feyerabendian concept of abundance. A set may be so abundant, without necessarily being infinite, that it cannot be defined absolutely, but only relatively, pragmatically, empirically. Such is the set of all beings, as Feyerabend understands being. Such is the set of all possible, in the sense of sustainable by being worldviews. They can't be totalized, but there's no reason to believe that they form an infinite set. Six, one could have lots of fun with the notion of self-withdrawn objects, and with the surprising idea that onto theology relies on the idea of a transcendent, non-self-withdrawn entity. This is truly a, a ludicrous notion. Unself-withdrawnness is in no way a necessary condition of transcendence. This is a surreptitious way of redefining the debate on onto theology, so as to make it true by definition that only O O O is an ontology of imminence.